Hi, everybody. I am um, going to give you a brief lecture on the history of evolution. I give it away with the slide, but really my point with this, um, this suite of mini lectures is to give you an education, give you a foundational education on how evolution works. You might think you already know how evolution works, or maybe you think it's too complicated and there are all sorts of intricacies that you can't understand. I suspect that neither of those are exactly true. The, um, so as I've told you guys, I really like teaching and I really like teaching evolution because I care deeply about evolution and using evolutionary free, uh, uh, using an evolutionary framework to understand plants and animals and people, the whole nine yards. Um, but I have found that the best way of teaching evolution isn't to give you the nuts and bolts of it, but to bring you along the historic pathway that brought us to where we are today and our understanding about how evolution works. So this is a kind of a history lecture, um, but it's about a very particular history. And when you're done, you're gonna understand how evolution works, which is awesome. Um, also, this is a high level stuff. The, this is not trivial. This is a deep understanding of this topic. All right, let's get started. So, slide one. We're gonna talk about the history of evolution. We are going to start with Erasmus Darwin. Okay, Erasmus Darwin was a character. So if you're listening to his name, you're like, any relation to our friend Charles Darwin? And in fact, this guy right here is the grandfather of our friend Chuck. So Erasmus Darwin was working in the end of the 1700s. And what was he doing for his job? Does anybody know? He was a doctor, a medical doctor. He was a medical doctor um, to the rich and famous. Um, a lot of his patients were royals or, you know, distant royals, not, he wasn't working in London. He had a stagecoach in a black bag and he went and he took his stagecoach from place to place and he went and he fixed people to the best of his ability. That was his, that was his career. But he had a secret passion. He had a couple of secret passions. He was an interesting guy. One of his secret passions was naturalism. He was a kick-ass naturalist and he really loved understanding how plants in particular and birds also and people, he wanted to know how they all worked. He wanted to know their natural history, where they lived, what they ate, what ate them, how they raised their young, how they reproduced. He wanted to know all of that. And you're like, oh, great. So he wanted to be a naturalist. Well, he's working at a time where being a naturalist is actually illegal. Yeah, yeah, the crown for beta. If you were going to take a class called biology, which would not have been called biology yet. It would all have almost been, the word existed, but it was not popularized. And it was, certainly wasn't popularized in England and it wasn't popularized in 1794. But if you wanted to take a class that covered the topics that would be covered in biology, the classes would be all about how you could observe nature and observe the structures in nature, but how they all informed you on ways to praise God. It's a true story in England. So not quite as draconian in other European countries, but all natural history, the songs of the birds, the beauty of the sunlight through the leaves of the trees, all the things that we, we still find um, emotionally stirring about nature. The classes were all about how all that stirring was ways to praise God. And you weren't allowed by the church and the crown to study that because the 
um, doctrine of the day was that God made the world perfect in all the ways that we see it. And that's all you need to know about that part. Erasmus didn't like that. <laughs> and other people, he wasn't alone. And so what would happen is they would study he really, Erasmus went through a period where he was studying plants, man. He really was studying plant sex. And he wrote these really long, terrible poems about plant sex. So I put, I found the shortest Erasmus Darwin poem I could find and I put it in this learning module. And you can see it's not that great of a poem. He wrote a lot of poems, wrote a lot of long poems, wrote a lot of long, bad poems. Um, but a lot of them were meant to be instructional. Like the plant sex poem, was a way to tell people how plants were having sex, but it was poetry, so you could get away with it. And um, anyways, he's writing these poems about things like plant sex. He has to use a pen name, but his friends know who he is and he knows who his friends are, even though they're all publishing in, in, in London with pen names. So um, I've actually, I told you that one of his secret passions was naturalists. Uh, but his second was poetry. He really, really loved poetry. So Rasmus Darwin is uh, married and he has, I can't remember if it's three sons or five sons. He had a boatload of kids. Um, he has all these kids, uh, but he doesn't have, this is early in his life. So he's only got three or five sons. One of them is Chuck Darwin's dad and his wife dies. And he falls in love with the neighbor across the pond who has no husband and he says to her hey you're single i'm single you want to get married and she's like no man you're too ugly he's like damn so he goes back home and he writes her these glorious poems and he hides them by the pond where she goes and she waters her sheep and every day she goes and she finds these poems and they get her so happy and so excited that she falls in love with the poet, not knowing it's Erasmus. And then when he finally tells her that he wrote the poems, she agreed to marry him. So it tells you about the power of poetry. So Erasmus Darwin didn't just love his neighbor. Actually, he, he before I go on about the story that is gonna bring us back to evolution, he was famous for a couple of things that the Me Too movement wouldn't fly, but he had at least 14 kids and he probably had two illegitimate kids. He was, the ladies liked him, despite the fact that he is not exactly, he was famous for being kind of a froggy looking guy. He was not, he was, uh, his, his detractors made fun of his, of his looks and he just embraced that. Um, which I think is kind of adorable. Oh, so where was I going with this? So, so he's kind of a, a ladies man, but also probably this is how he got into so many panties of the day. Um, he was um, all for educating women and he set up a whole bunch of girls schools and funded some girls schools and tried to get more um, education set up for girls and women. And so I guess he really liked them. I guess he <laughs> genuinely liked them. Uh, okay, but that's not really where I was going with this story. So where I'm going with this story, okay, I'm getting, I'm getting to the evolution part because he is actually really, this is a great place to start the story. Um, so amongst the other things he was doing aside from falling in love with the way plants have sex is he was studying scallops. Okay, you know, like the, the clams that, right? Uh, and he's like, what do they eat? Where do they sleep? Who eats them? What do they What do they eat? How do they move? How do they have sex? So he spends a long time trying to figure out what the hell scallops are doing. <laughs> and honestly, it's a good question. Have you ever thought about how scallops have sex? Have you? Do you know how scallops have sex? Mm. Uh, I'm not giving that lecture. Actually, I don't know. I know about barnacle sex, which is weird. You know, a barnacle penis is like this, can't even see, it's like this long, <laughs> barnacle penis. <laughs> That's a true fact. You can Google image that if you want to do fun things to your browser history. Okay, so he's studying scallops. And at the time um, of his, uh, when he's studying scallops, 
you know, it, Friday nights, all the nerds get a, get together and they have like a, a Friday night nerd fest and they talk about what they're learning about the creatures that they're studying and, you know, they're interpreting each other's data and they're helping each other figure out what the plants are doing, what the moss is doing, what the scallops are doing. And, you know, on his Friday night, um, his Friday night, I imagine they're drinking beer and hanging around the table talking about scallops and politics and whatever nerds talk about when they get around the table. And so he has become really famous for understanding all the things I just said about scallops. And he publishes um, a foundational piece about, about scallops in London under a pen name. <clears throat> and he is so proud of his work for figuring out what he does that <clears throat> he puts scallops on his stationery and he puts scallops on the door above his stagecoach like he embraces the whole scallop thing but he's publishing under a pen name and um the way he gets away with the scallop thing is it means fidelity to the crown and um but it was getting too hot and people were guessing that he was the guy who was studying scallops and publishing about scallops. So he had to, he took the, the scallops off his stagecoach and off his stationery. Um, the, the, the cover of being um, fidelity to the crown wasn't, he wasn't convinced that was gonna fly. So, oh, one last interesting fact about Erasmus Darwin is he was asked to be the physician to the king and he said, yeah, thanks, no thanks. He, he didn't take that honor. Okay, so I've given you a brief history of Erasmus. Now let's go to the next slide because he did something that was pretty amazing. So one of the things that makes a naturalist a good naturalist, and for those of you, I suspect usually these days I have one or two people who are students who are really good naturalists, is that it really just takes time and listening and looking when you're outside. So going for a walk and paying attention to what's under your feet. And so by the time Erasmus was grandfatherly, he's tramping through the fields and dales with his grandson, Chuck, Charles Darwin. And they're on these cliffs. They live in a part of England that has these super high cliffs. And I'm sure if you've watched any PBS romantic show or murder mystery, somebody has been pushed off, fallen off, been driven off the cliffs to their deaths. It's a long way down, these cliffs. So he's walking on top of these cliffs with his grandson. And you can just imagine they're holding, he's got Chuck's a little hand in his and they're walking over these rocks crunch, 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 crunch. and he's looking down he's like huh why do i find seashells on top of dried up mountains and he's looking down and he's like wow that ocean is far away i mean i can see it but it's like a long way down between where i'm standing and where the ocean it's not like a tidal wave came and put these these seashells here these seashells must have been part of the seafloor at some point. So this is just observation, right? Right. He's looking around. He's going, mm, seashells up here where they don't belong. They must have belonged here. Somehow this must have been part of the ocean at some point in time. And he is not alone. He's working at a time where, and I don't, I don't cover this in this lecture, but I'm sure you guys have heard about, you know, this is the time when the um, geologists, and the map makers are looking at, they've got enough information about the size of the continent and they can see that the continents um, used to fit together. And that did suggest that if God made the world perfect as the way it is, that somehow those two pieces, those two puzzle pieces used to be together. And so maybe God did it, maybe God didn't do it, but you certainly don't need God for there had to have been something like this that goes like this. What you need instead of God is time. So he writes to his friends, would it be too bold to imagine the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind. So what he's saying is that 
can you imagine if this is true that it's been a long time since the earth started perhaps millions of ages millions of years before the beginning of human history so he's suggesting for the very first time that the earth is older than biblical interpretations so let's talk about the biblical interpretations for a minute. So um, maybe some of you guys have heard that the, um, the world is 6,000 years old and change. Biblical fundamentalists like to put that number out there. And it actually comes from an Irish bishop who took a look at the Bible and people have wondered how old the earth is for a long time. How old is the world? That's a good question. How old is the world? How would you know? We have better answers now than we did in Darwin's time. But Darwin was not the first one to wonder, and nor was he the last. Um, but before Erasmus Darwin and all the geologists at the time were going, hmm, the world is really goddamn old. Oh, God, me with my potty mouth, I'm so sorry. Um, the world is really old. Um, the Irish guy, whose name I can never remember. I should have looked it up for this lecture. I did not look it up. You guys can look it up. What he did is he's like, huh, I wonder how old God said the world is. So he goes to the book of Genesis. And if any of you are familiar with the book of Genesis, it's essentially a genealogy chapter. It's this guy beget this guy, okay? And beget just means sired, fathered, caused to come into being. This guy beget 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 this guy. So it's a whole long genealogy. So the bishop goes and counts all of the begets. So he thinks that he's measured all of the generations recorded in the Bible. And he multiplies that times 20 or 25, whatever generation, whatever generation length um, he found suitable. And if you take all those begets and you multiply them by 22 or 25, you get 6,000 and change. So the church at the time that Darwin, that Erasmus Darwin was working was all about the world is 6,000 years old. And Erasmus Darwin is going, I think we needed more time than 6,000 years to get these crunchy seashells up here on top of the mountain from the ocean. His observation is matching what is making what the map makers and the geologists are saying. Okay, I bet you now know more about Erasmus Darwin than you ever knew before. And he was an interesting, funny guy. I hope you enjoyed this.